Hello class, welcome to our next lecture here in our Principles of Microeconomics course. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the production possibilities frontier, trade, and the circular flow model. So essentially, we're going to be introducing ourselves to two economic models in this lecture. To give you a little roadmap of what we're going to discuss in this lecture, we're going to first start by talking about our first model in the course, or our first graph in the course, and that's the production possibilities frontier. Through the production possibilities frontier, we'll actually be able to calculate opportunity costs so you can kind of visualize and see how that works. We'll also discuss the ramifications of having a nonlinear production possibilities frontier. We'll talk about economic growth, trade, a uh, comparative advantage, which is an important tool and key for determining whether or not firms, countries, individuals trade with each other. And then we'll finish the course by discussing or dis to finish the lecture by discussing the circular flow model and markets. So to preface the production possibilities frontier, last lecture we discussed this relationship between scarcity and choice. We have limited resources, unlimited wants, and we have to make choices as a result of those limited resources. So uh, this first graph that we're going to introduce today, the production possibilities frontier, also known as the PPF, is going to allow us to understand this consequence and visualize it so we can kind of discuss what are the best ways to assess or allocate resources. Um, because this graph might not necessarily allow for us to, to answer an optimization question, but as we move on in the course towards the end of the semester, we will be, be able to answer the question as it pertains to this uh, graph that I'm about to introduce to you. So the production possibilities frontier is going to be a graph that shows the combinations of goods and services that can be produced with available resources and given technology. So there are two key things there. There's available resources, so there's resources that we have accessible to us, and there's technological abilities that we have that allow for us to be more efficient with our production process given those resources that are available to us. Now, this is not a graph, this is just a table. And in this table, we have a column that shows five different combinations. And those combinations correspond to either producing hybrid cars or trucks. So at combination A, so all of these combinations are known as a production schedule. This production schedule is telling us that we can utilize all of our resources and technology to produce these potential combinations. There's more than these five, but these five are the ones that we're going to start with. Combination A says that if we allocate all of our resources to hybrid vehicles, we can produce 200,000 of them. Combination E says that if we allocate all of our resources to trucks, we can produce 200,000 trucks. Combinations B, C, and D are basically combinations where we're going to uh, allocate some of our resources to hybrid cars and some of our resources to trucks, and we get different combinations of output from that allocation. If we take these points and we plot them on a xy axis where one axis represents hybrid cars and one axis represents trucks we can plot those points and connect a linear graph that allows for us to have our initial production possibilities frontier so taking that information from the previous slide and plotting it on a graph gives us this production possibilities frontier. So we're gonna say that it's the Ford Motor Company whose production possibilities frontier this is, um, as an example. So on our y-axis, our vertical axis, we have hybrid vehicles. On our x-axis, our horizontal axis, we have trucks that are being produced and represented by that graph. So our point A was only producing hybrids, which we can see right here is our um, allocation in point A on those combinations that we had on the previous uh, table. Point B is represented here, point C is represented here, point D is represented here, and point E is represented here. So all of those points exist, so we can even label it as such. So A, B, C, D, and E. 
Obviously, that is only five points. There's actually many other points on this production possibilities frontier represented by the blue line on the graph that can uh, be combinations utilizing all of the resources and technology for that firm. Uh, there are also combinations that are not utilizing all of the resources. So let's say we take 50,000 and 50,000 right there, call that point F. That is also attainable. So any point inside of that blue line that is bounded by the axes is also a feasible point that can be produced. The difference between point F and points A, B, C, D, and E is that point F is considered inefficient because we're not utilizing all of our resources. Ford has a certain number of labor, a certain level of capital, certain level of machinery, certain level of raw materials, and in order for them to maximize whatever they're trying to maximize, which in this case is profits, they want to utilize all of those resources that are available to them. So if they're operating at point F instead of point B or A or C or D, then they're not using some of their resources, and that's considered inefficient. Now let's take uh, point G here. Let's say it's at, whoops, excuse me. Let's say point G is 200,000 uh, hybrids and 150,000 trucks. Point G is considered unattainable. We can't actually produce at point G. The problem is, is that at point G, we don't have enough resources or technology to produce that level. So point G is considered unattainable. Point F is inefficient. Point G is unattainable. Points A, B, C, D, and E are considered inefficient. So Ford has a dilemma because if they are utilizing all of their resources, then unfortunately they're going to have to give up some amount of hybrid cars or trucks to produce more of the other product. So we have hybrid cars, we have trucks. If we're operating on that production possibilities frontier, such as points A, B, C, D, and E, in order for us to move from, say, from point A to point B, we're going to have to give up some hybrid cars. If we're moving from point E to point D, we're going to have to give up some trucks. And that's known as trade-off. Now, if we want to know the specific amount of hybrids or trucks that we're going to have to give up to be able to produce one more unit of the other product, that is actually going to be known as our opportunity cost. So in our last lecture, we discussed the opportunity cost as the highest valued alternative that must be given up in order to engage in an activity. That is actually what we're actually going to be able to measure in our production possibilities frontier before. It could be subjective a little bit in the way because it's the highest valued alternative. Since we only have two options here, hybrid cars or trucks, then we just assume the highest valued alternative is the other product. Now, if we had a three-dimensional graph or n dimensions, then you would have to choose between them to determine what is the highest valued alternative. But it, the PPF makes it simple. So to kind of recap the key information that you can uh, glean from the production possibilities frontier is that any point along the production possibilities frontier is considered efficient. That means that resources are being used to produce to the limits of the firm, country, or individual, whoever we're representing on that graph. Uh, points inside the line are feasible, but they're inefficient. So that means that we're basically wasting resources. We're not being allocatively efficient. That's why it's considered inefficient. Points beyond that production possibilities frontier are considered unattainable. I mean, unless we change some resources, we find some more resources, we innovate and come up with new technology, we aren't going to be able to produce that quantity of those two products that are represented on the graph. Now we can actually calculate the opportunity cost. If we have a numerical value that represents the amount of hybrids that can be produced at a certain point and the number of trucks that can be produced at a certain point or any sort of combination of goods and services, we could actually calculate what that opportunity cost is because we're assuming that it's the highest valued alternative. The way I like to do it is I like to take whatever is being given up and put that in the numerator of a fraction. The reason why this is the case is because 
The opportunity cost is actually the slope of the production possibilities frontier. So the slope of the production possibilities frontier is actually the opportunity cost. Now, it's actually kind of the inverse of the slope if you're going in the other direction. That's why I don't focus specifically on slope. But basically, if you follow this process, you'll be able to understand the ratio between what is given up and what is being produced. I always take whatever product is being given up and put that in the numerator and make sure that you kind of identify it with a negative sign. And in the bottom is the amount of the product that you're receiving from that movement from a specific point on the production possibilities frontier, say point B to point C. Now, if we want to calculate the opportunity cost, this is data that I'm pulling from the original graph that I showed before. The simplest way to do this if you have a linear production possibilities frontier, it's different if you have a nonlinear production possibilities frontier, as we'll discuss in a little bit because of the fact that the slope is constantly changing. Here, your slope is going to be constant all the way through, so that line is constant. So the rate of change is going to be consistent no matter you, whether you're moving from point A to point B or from point C to point E or B to D or some other point that's on the line that we didn't represent by those initial five combinations. The simplest way to do it if you have a linear production possibilities frontier is to go from one intercept to the other intercept. So if we go from making only hybrids to only trucks, we can take that ratio because the slope will be the exact same whether we go from one extreme to the other or a little smidge along the line and we'll get the same answer. So I've shown you the calculation. So whatever is being given up is going to be in the numerator. So if we're, we want to produce another truck, we want to produce trucks, we take the numerator, which is 200,000 hybrids are going to be given up because if we're going from one intercept one extreme to the other if we're making only hybrids to only trucks we're going to give up all the hybrids which was 200,000. If we go from making only hybrids to only trucks we're going to be making only trucks so when we produce only trucks we produce 200,000 trucks so that goes in the denominator. So to be clear here I put in the fraction there what is lost is equal to cost. That's a simple little device there that I like to use to show you that that is what the actual opportunity cost is. One of the mistakes that people will make later on when we do comparative advantage in this lecture is people will see the lower cost as the, pro as the advantage in the product that they're producing. But no, that's actually kind of the measurement of the cost. It's no different than dollars or euros or cents or Bitcoin or whatever. Basically... What is lost is going to be the numerator, and that's the actual cost. Whatever is being produced is in the denominator, and that's really the product that you're interested in knowing what the opportunity cost is of. So if we divide 200,000 by 200,000, we end up getting those numbers canceling out. So when you cancel those out, you get a 1 over 1 relationship. So what that means is that you'll get negative one hybrid in the numerator, positive one truck in the denominator. So if you want to interpret that result, remember what is being produced is in the denominator. So that means that in order to produce that one truck, the cost of producing that additional truck is giving up one hybrid car. So the opportunity cost of producing one additional truck for Ford is to give up one hybrid. Now, if we want to figure out the opportunity cost of producing one hybrid, uh, all we got to do is flip that fraction upside down. Keep the signs where they were, so keep the negative in the top, because remember what is lost is the cost, and keep the positive sign in the denominator. So, but flip the numbers. So here, if you notice, trucks were in the bottom, and now trucks are in the top, but the sign is negative, so the negative sign stays in the numerator, and the positive sign stays in the denominator, on the bottom of the fraction. So, in order to produce one additional hybrid, we're going to have to give up 
200,000 trucks. Because again, we're going intercept to intercept from one extreme to the other. So we're giving up all the trucks now to make only hybrids. When we do that, we give up 200,000 trucks. And in exchange, we get 200,000 hybrids. So when you divide that out, you end up getting that same one-to-one -one relationship. But now we're producing hybrids. So in order to produce one additional hybrid car, we're gaining one hybrid car. We have to lose or give up one truck. And that's how we calculate the opportunity cost. So on your homeworks or quizzes or exams, you will be required to be able to do this calculation. But if you don't feel comfortable with it yet, I have one more example for you. So this is the production possibilities frontier of Waffle Hop, the Waffle House of Pancakes. So if you can't decide between Waffle House or IHOP, I've got news for you. I've combined them into one business. If we look at the intercepts here, okay, so these intercepts represent that if we only produce waffles right here at point A, if we only produce waffles, we can produce 30,000 waffles on the production possibilities frontier with the available resources and current technology for Waffle Hop. If we operate at point B instead, that's not 13, that's B, I promise, we can produce 90,000 pancakes, but no waffles. And then there's a bunch of combinations in between that are represented by blue. Now, if we operate at point C here and want to produce 10,000 waffles and 20,000 pancakes, that's doable, but it's inefficient. We want to focus on the efficient points. If we wanted to produce 30,000 uh, waffles and 60,000 pancakes and at point D, that's unattainable. We can't produce that. So the question then becomes, what is the opportunity cost to produce one additional pancake? And what is the opportunity cost to produce one additional waffle? So let's figure it out. Let's produce pancakes first. Let's take the slope of this line. So if we go from one extreme to the other, point A to point B, we're going to give up 30,000 waffles represented here. And we're going to gain 90,000 pancakes represented here. When we divide out 30,000 waffles by 90,000 pancakes, that becomes a one up top and a three in the denominator. So what that really represents is that in order to produce three pancakes, you have to give up one waffle. But if we want to know the specific opportunity cost of producing one pancake, then we need to divide that, the, divide both sides by three to make the denominator one. And when we do that, we're actually giving up one third of a waffle to get one pancake. So right here, in order, if we want to know the specific relationship of producing one additional pancake, I don't want three pancakes, I just want one pancake. How many waffles am I giving up in that process? Well, in that case, when we divide both sides by three here, we end up getting this relationship where this becomes one and this becomes one third. So the opportunity cost here is in order to produce one additional pancake, we must give up one third of a waffle. Let's flip it and produce some waffles. If we want to produce waffles, we're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going extreme to extreme, so we're going from point B to point A. So we're going to lose 90,000 pancakes, and we're going to gain 30,000 waffles. And there is a typo here, of course. You know, I couldn't make it through the day without a typo, so we're going to erase that, 3, and make it a 1 waffle. Excuse my finger writing on the slide, um, but that's the benefit of having a touch screen for your computer is that we can fix typos in real time. Excuse me. So, if we take negative 90,000 pancakes and divide that by 30,000, we end up with a 3 to 1 ratio. So the denominator is just 1 now, so we have our final answer there. In order to produce one additional waffle, 
We must give up three pancakes. So, if for the homeworks and for the quizzes and for the exams, for the most part, I will probably give you linear production possibilities frontiers, but that does not mean that the relationship in reality is always going to be one to one or or a consistent slope. We have nonlinear production possibilities frontiers. Not all opportunity costs are constant. In fact, in most situations, opportunity costs are not going to be constant. But for the sake of simplicity and calculations, I keep them linear so you truly understand. Because it's about you understanding the concept than being able to do a bunch of crazy math. You will have to do a significant amount of math in this course, but I want to make sure that it's reasonable so you can at least understand the relationship. Because it's understanding the relationship that's important to me beyond just doing the math. So in reality here, what's going on is that not all opportunity costs are going to be constant. In most situations, they're not going to be. In fact, we have what's known as increasing marginal opportunity costs. So when we have these uh, increasing marginal opportunity costs, what really is going on is that the slope is going to be constantly changing throughout the movement from, say, point A to point B to point C to that automobile's intercept as demonstrated by the figure on the screen. If we move from point A to point B, if we want to produce 50 or, excuse me, 200 additional automobiles, we're going to be giving up 50 tanks. So if we want to calculate the opportunity cost there, if we're moving from, say, point A to point B, we're giving up 50 tanks to produce 200 automobiles. And when we cancel that out, we end up with negative one tank over positive four automobiles. So the opportunity cost to produce one additional automobile is actually going to be one fourth of a tank. So this is from A to B. If we wanna move from point B to point C, we want to produce another 200 automobiles. We're actually going to give up 150 tanks in that process, not 50. So we end up losing 150 tanks in order to gain 200 automobiles, which results in the opportunity cost going to be three tanks to four automobiles. So really our opportunity cost tripled from producing the first 200 to producing the second 200, which is why we have what's known as increasing marginal opportunity costs. So in last lecture, we talked about marginal meaning additional. So the additional opportunity cost is actually going to be triple that of the original because now to move from point B to point C, we're giving up three fourths of a tank. So that's three times as much as before. If we wanted to move all the way from C to this intercept here, we'll call it point D. And then in that process, we're actually going to lose 200 tanks, gain only 100 automobiles. So our opportunity cost there is going to be two tanks, which is uh, two and a half times more than moving from point B to point C and a lot more than moving from point A to point B eight times more. So notice how as we kept giving up more or trying to produce more and more automobiles, we kept giving up more and more tanks. So this is kind of how it happens in reality, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'll probably keep the production possibilities frontiers linear for the sake of calculating costs. Now the question is, can we move beyond an initial allocation and an initial production possibilities frontier, or are we just kind of stuck where we're at forever? And the answer is yes, we can move farther. Uh, there are two assumptions made in that PPF definition that I gave you earlier, available resources and given technology. So if we're able to find some resources and, and acquire additional resources, then we can produce more of that good or service or both maybe, 
depends on the scenario. Or if we innovate and come up with additional technological advancement, then we can produce more with less or more in the same amount of time. So those are going to be examples of economic growth. If we increase our technology or if we increase our resources, which is more difficult for some countries than others, then we experience economic growth and we demonstrate that by shifting the production possibilities frontier to the right. So let's say I have a production possibilities frontier. I have good X and I have good Y. If I want to demonstrate some technological advancement, I can shift the curve out to the right. Keep shifting it to the right. And that's an example of economic growth. Now, uh, it could also be that, let's say that the hybrid batteries are more efficient to produce for trucks, or excuse me, hybrid cars than for trucks. And so if trucks were here and hybrids were here, if we were initially here, we might actually have a situation where H is shifts out, but T stays the same because that technological advancement only affects trucks and not hybrid cars, or excuse me, only affects hybrid cars and not trucks. So here's an example of that, more clearly visible than my simple finger paintings in orange. So if we have a shift out of the production possibilities frontier due to some technological advance for defining new resources, we're going to move the entire line out to the right. And so with the similar amounts of resources or the same amount of resources, we can actually produce an additional 50 automobiles and three or excuse me, additional 100 tanks with those resources. And then if that technological advancement only happens in the auto industry and not so much in the military, uh, industrial tank industry, then we would see a Boeing out. So even if we only made tanks, we would only be able to make the same out before because that technological advancement only affects automobiles. And so automobile, we could produce more automobiles, but we can't produce more tanks. The last way in which we can attain uh, additional production or consumption, if this is for individual people, beyond available resources and given technologies going up, is to trade. So the one of the important concepts in this course is to understand markets and to understand trades and how that provides efficiency or provides benefit to parties to be able to consume more or produce more than they could by themselves individually. So the last way in which we can achieve a level of production beyond our initial production possibilities frontier endowment is to trade. Now the difference between trade and uh, technological advancement or increases in resources is that instead of the curve shifting out or the production possibilities frontier shifting to the right, we're actually just going to end up at a point, specific point that is beyond the initial production possibilities frontier. Now, a very important thing to understand is the difference between absolute advantage right here and comparative advantage, which is going to be on the next slide. Absolute advantage is uh, something that is is often mistaken for the reason why we should or should not trade with a foreign country or why or why not individuals should trade with each other. Absolute advantage is the ability to produce more of a good or service than competitors with similar amounts of resources. So this just basically means I can make more than you, so therefore I'm better than you, and there's no reason for me to trade with you. But that is incorrect in its analysis, because just because you can make more of a specific good or service than your competitor does not mean that you'll be able to produce more of it while still being able to produce the things that you need 
beyond that specific product. So let's say the United States could produce bananas, more bananas than Colombia or Guatemala or Costa Rica or some other nation in Latin America. That does not mean that we should just make bananas and not trade for bananas. Because in the process of producing more bananas, we're going to have to reallocate some of our already existing agricultural land to produce those bananas. And in the process, we're going to lose out on production of other goods and services, maybe avocados or oranges or coffee or something like that, that we might be already producing. Or in general, let's just say that we hire individuals to produce those bananas from, our, from the United States. And instead of that, them being sent to college and being able to become an engineer or a doctor that could create more wealth or productivity or efficiency in our country, we're making bananas. And bananas are good in potassium and bananas are affordable and important, but is it worth that trade-off? And for our country, we've decided, no, it's better for us to import our bananas than to do that. So why do we import our bananas even if we could produce more bananas? And the reason why is because of what's known as comparative advantage. So the basis for trade is not absolute advantage, just being able to make a higher volume than your competitor. It is comparative advantage, which is the ability to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than your competitor. So the reason why we went through that calculation of opportunity cost of the production possibilities frontier is because we need to know that information in order to determine whether or not countries, individuals, firms should trade with each other. If you don't know that information, then you don't necessarily know whether or not you should trade with each other or if there's a missed opportunity there. So that's why it's so important to understand this concept of calculating opportunity costs, because that's the reason why we trade. It's not enough to just say that I can make more than you. It's to say that I can produce it with giving up less in that process, because the reality is, is that if you, you could produce more bananas, but if you're operating on the intercept for bananas and you can produce more than Colombia or Guatemala or some other nation that means that you're basically giving up everything else that you could produce cars planes medical care education other agricultural items etc now that's a pretty extreme example but that's really what the heart of comparative advantage is getting at it's not to say that uh, I can't do each thing individually better than another individual, or we can't produce a product individually better than another country. But the problem is, is that there's that trade-off involved. When you produce only one thing, you produce more of one thing, you're giving up something else that you could be doing instead. So if you've ever had a boss at your job where basically they micromanaged you and they basically got in your way and started doing your job for you because they felt like they could do it better than you. That is an inefficient process in your company because the reason why they're the manager is because there is a lower opportunity cost for them to manage than for them to manage and do your task, which you have been specialized and chosen to do. The reality is, is that if you do your task and they do their task that individually, then collectively the firm will get more done in productivity than if they just micromanage you and do everything. So yes, they might be able to do that task better than there because you just got hired. They've been there years, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's best for the company for that to happen. That's why there's delegation happening. That's why you got hired in the first place. So that's where comparative advantage comes from. It doesn't have to just be about whether we trade with China, whether we trade with France or Guatemala or some other country. It really just comes down to as simple as, okay, who does the chores in the house? Who washes the dishes? Who takes out the trash? Who does the laundry? Because in a way, by 
delegating those tasks out and specializing them, it allows for people to get more done in the same amount of time, which allows for you to have more free time, which allows for you to make more money or whatever the reason being, and it creates more kind of economic surplus, as we like to call it, versus just kind of micromanaging and being inefficient with your time and your resources. As a result, if we rely on and delegate tasks to those who have comparative advantages in them, in them, then we specialize in those tasks. And when we specialize in those tasks, so say if it's just production of a specific good or service, then what we can do is we can trade a specific amount of what we have produced with what the other individual has produced. And then we overall ultimately end up with a what's known as gains from trade, which means that we'll actually, when we combine what we produced and gave away whatever's left over with what the other person gave to us in the trade, we actually have a combination of the two goods and services that is beyond what we could have done individually. Even if we could have made more of each individually than that other country, we're still better off. And that's what's known as gains from trade. So let's see it in action. So let's do an example with apples and cherries. We have two individuals named George and John. They have the ability to produce apples and cherries, but the amounts that they can produce are different. George can produce up to 30 pounds of apples or 60 pounds of cherries. So that's going to be representative of our intercepts on our production possibilities frontier. George can produce only 30 apples by itself or 60 pounds of cherries by itself. John, on the other hand, unfortunately, can only produce 20 apples exclusively, one intercept, or 20 pounds of cherries, one intercept. So the question is, who has the absolute advantage? Who has the comparative advantage? And should they trade or not? So let's look at the production possibilities frontiers. So the green axis, the y-axis, the vertical axis represents apples. The horizontal or red axis represents cherries. So John can produce either 20 pounds of cherries or 20 pounds of apples or some combination of the two represented by that blue bar, that production possibilities frontier. Whereas George can produce 30 pounds of apples or 60 pounds of cherries represented by that blue bar. Now, absolute advantage is just producing more of a good or service than your competitor. So we can just look at the intercepts and whoever is a bigger number on that intercept has the absolute advantage. So in this case, George can produce 30. John can only produce 20. Therefore, George has the absolute advantage for producing apples. So George has the absolute advantage. Now let's look at cherries. John can only produce 20. George can produce 60. So George also has the absolute advantage for cherries. Now, since George has the absolute advantage for both products, does that mean that he shouldn't trade with John? And the answer is no, because of the fact that George can produce more of them individually, but when he tries to produce them both by himself, he's going to run into a problem where he has to basically trade off some of the cherries to produce more apples and some of the apples to produce more cherries. And the question is, okay, well, what combination do I do that makes me better off? If we go to an analyzing things through comparative advantage, on the other hand, then it might turn out that John might be able to contribute and allow for there to be a gains from trade if one or the other of them specialize in a specific product and then trade that product to each other for the other one. So the next step we need to do is we need to calculate opportunity costs because that's how we determine comparative advantage. So if we move, so if we want to calculate the opportunity cost for John, we're going for producing cherries, we're going to give up 20 apples, we're going to produce 20 cherries. So that means in the numerator, we're going to give up 20. In the denominator, we're going to gain 20. So that means the opportunity cost to produce one additional cherry is going to be one apple. If we want to produce 
apples on the other hand, then that means that the opportunity cost is going to be the inverse of that. So we're going to give up 20 cherries to produce 20 apples. So the opportunity cost to produce one apple is one cherry. So this is apples and this is cherries. There's, that's an ES, I promise. Uh, now, looking for George, if we want to calculate the opportunity cost for him, we're going to give up 30 apples to produce 60 cherries. So to produce 60, or excuse me, one additional cherry, we're actually going to be giving up one half of an apple. It says cherry, I promise. If we want to go the other way, we're going to give up 60 uh, cherries and we're going to gain 30 apples. So we're actually going to be giving up two cherries to produce an apple. So now with this newfound information, we can determine who has app or excuse me, comparative advantage for both uh, specific products. So in order to produce apples, John gave up one cherry. In order to produce uh, one cherry, he gave up one apple. In order for John to produce one apple, he gave up two cherries. And in order to produce one uh, cherry, he gave up a half of an apple. Based on this information, so remember the cost is going to be whatever is given up and whatever is being gained is what the comparative advantage would be in. Since George is only giving up a half of an apple to make a cherry, and John is giving up one full apple to make a cherry. That means that George has the comparative advantage in cherries because of the fact that he's gaining cherries. This is just the cost. Apples are just the cost in this example, so you could just trade it out, swap it out with dollar cents, Bitcoin, euros, drachma, whatever. Basically, that's just the cost. Whatever he's producing is what the comparative advantage is in. If, on the other hand, John is only giving up one cherry to produce an apple, and George is giving up two cherries, which means that John has the comparative advantage in apples. As a result, uh, because of this comparative advantage, that means that both parties should specialize in the product that they have the comparative advantage in. George should produce 60 pounds of cherries. John should produce 20 pounds of apples. And then in order for them to get a gains of trade, they'll negotiate a certain amount of each product and it'll result in a mutual benefit. An example of this would be George could produce 45 pounds of cherries. Or excuse me, 60 pounds of cherries. Trade 15 of them to John. So John ends up with 15 cherries and George ends up with 45 cherries. And then John could produce uh, 20 apples, give 10 of them to George, and keep 10 of them for himself. If this is the case, then we end up with George having, based on, if you do, trust me on this, if you do the calculation through, he would end up with an additional three cherries, an additional one apple, because individually he would be able to produce 42 cherries and 9 apples. But with the trade he now has an additional 3 cherries and an additional 1 apple. And individually John could produce 9 apples and 11 cherries. So now he ends up with an additional 4 cherries and an additional 1 apple. So the gains from trade are such. Those are both points that are beyond the production possibilities for a tier that were initially available to them. And so by even though that George had the uh, absolute advantage for both products, he actually ends up better off by trading with John because of comparative advantage. So that is the basis for trade, not absolute advantage. It's important, and I will definitely test you on the difference between the two. Another example here is uh producing computer chips and aircraft between the united states and france so we need to determine whether the u.s and france should trade with each other so who has the absolute advantage well if we just look at the intercepts the u.s can produce 50 aircraft france can only produce 30 
Uh, U.S. can produce 100 computer chips, and France can only produce 50. So the U.S. has the uh, excuse me the absolute advantage for both. Does that mean that they shouldn't trade with each other? No. Uh, in fact, we need to look at comparative advantage to determine whether or not they should trade with each other. So, in order to determine comparative advantage, we need to calculate our opportunity costs for aircraft and computer chips. So, in order to produce one additional computer chip, we're going to be giving up 50 aircraft, gaining 100 computer chips. So, in order to produce one computer chip, which I will denote as CC, we will be giving up one half of an aircraft. Now, a simple thing to do is to just reciprocate this answer to get the answer instead of having to go through the whole process. So in order to produce one aircraft, we're actually going to be giving up two computer chips. Because if we go the other direction, it's 100 over 50, which is two. If we want to calculate the opportunity cost for France, in order to produce one additional aircraft, they're giving up 30 aircraft in order to gain 50 computer chips. So if we divide 30 by 50, that is three-fifths to produce one additional computer chip. Again, this is not to scale because 100 computer chips definitely costs a lot less than producing even like one one-thousandth, maybe even one one-millionth of an aircraft. So, But it was just for the sake of simplicity. So... If we flip this again, so in order to produce one additional aircraft, we can just, instead of going 50 over 30, oh, cancel out the zeros, we end up with five-thirds of a computer chip. So again, the comparative advantage will be in the product that is on the left, whatever is on the right. These are the opportunity costs. So these are the opportunity costs. And what's on the left is your product that you're actually making. So it, it appears that one half is left in three fifths. So that means that the US has the comparative advantage in computer chips and five thirds is definitely less than two. So that means that France has the comparative advantage in aircrafts, which means that the US should specialize in computer chips and France should specialize in aircraft and then they will trade a certain amount to each other. Doesn't really seem like a fair trade in money, money aspect, but for the sake of the example, they should trade. So that is trade, that is comparative advantage, that is the production possibilities frontier. So moving forward, we'll move on to our kind of last concept of this lecture and that is to bring in our new model, which is the circular flow model. But we'll preface that circular flow model by talking about markets. So there are important keys to this circular flow model to understand. There are going to be two major parties in it. So this represents the market system that we talked about in last lecture, where households and firms determine the distribution of resources in that country. Firms are assumed to be the suppliers of goods and services. So firms produce TVs, food, services, etc., that we buy with our money to get utility or get what we need, get what we want, etc. However, on the other hand, households are assumed to be the suppliers of the factors of production. It's important that we have this balanced relationship because we need the goods and services that firms produce Firms, in order to produce those goods and services, need the stuff that we provide, which are the factors of production. Factors of production are just the elements needed to produce goods and services, and we break it into four categories. The first one is labor. The second one is capital, which is like physical capital, like machinery and equipment. Natural resources, like raw materials. And then entrepreneurial ability. Entrepreneurial ability, the assumption there is that managers and entrepreneurs uh, are humans and managers and people that get hired to organize the business in a manner that provides the highest level of efficiency. So all four of those factors of production are assumed to be possessed by the, uh, excuse me, by households. 
And just to recap what markets are, because we're going to have two distinct markets here, the product market, which is the market of goods and services, and the factor market. Uh, we have two distinct markets because these are groups of buyers and sellers and in the institutions by which they come together to trade. So those two things will be distinct mediums in which firms will get the factors of productions that they need to produce goods and services. And then the latter will be the, good, the market where we typically assume markets to exist like Amazon or the grocery store or et cetera, where we're basically getting the goods and services that we need uh, to eat, entertain, etc. So more discussion on markets. So the factor market is going to be where firms are going to basically get the factors of production that they need to produce those goods and services. So they're going to be the demanders of the factors of production. Households are going to be the suppliers of the factors of production. And they're going to enter that factor market and discuss the terms of compensation for labor, for entrepreneurial ability, for capital or natural resource. So maybe you possess oil or maybe you possess uh, land. Basically, you'll negotiate a price for that land so the business can pr build on that land or have those resources to uh, produce the good or service that they need with that oil. Or you'll get hired to be a manager of a firm or you'll be hired to be an employee of the firm and you get paid for providing the services that you provide in terms of labor and entrepreneurial ability to help them produce and make money. So with that, basically what ends up happening is the negotiations are finalized and then you go and contribute to producing that good or service at work or you sell the land off, but in return you get compensated. Well. When you get compensated, you need to spend that money to get the things that you need. That's the reason why you have that job. So what you do is you go into the product market, and now those firms have finished producing those goods and services, and then they sell them to you in the product market, and that's how they make their money. And then they take that money, and then they buy it or buy uh, resources and hire workers and managers to help produce more. And then this basically as you'll see and you'll it, it sounds like it's going to kind of just be this endless cycle of we work and sell our resources so they can produce a good or service and then they we buy their goods and services and then they take that money and then they hire us and then blah 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 and then basically it's just a big circle bam so here's a one i actually have two slides with circular flow models this is the one from a textbook where basically you're going to have households and firms on each side and then your product market and your factor market are going to be the two mediums in institutions where the trades occur. So households su supply the factors of production. So that's what that blue arrow represents. Uh, and then basically the negotiation happens in the factor market. And then as a result, it determines that you will be compensated on an agreed amount and that becomes your wage or if you're selling land that be, that's the other payment that you receive then the firm takes those factors of production makes stuff with it and that's represented by the red arrow which is the goods and services the green arrow always represents money so firms take the money to the factor market and they pay you with it then you take that money into the product market and then you pay them with it to basically get those goods and services that they that either you helped produce or someone else produced and now you can watch the super bowl or netflix or go to a nice restaurant or go to the doctor or hire a lawyer etc uh in that product market which is goods and services and so the reason why it's called a circular flow model is because the green arrow is continuously flowing in one direction, representing the consistent flow of money. And then the two distinct markets basically represent these two transactional relationships where basically, as we'll learn in the next lecture, supply and demand, household controls supply in the factor market and firms control demand in the factor market. And then in the product market, households control demand and firms control supply. And then here's just one more, uh, not a circle, which is why I put the other one in there. This is more of like a rectangular flow model. 
but uh, it kind of is the exact same thing that I mentioned before. The turquoise arrow represents the money, and then you have the factor and product market where you have the gold arrows representing the transactional relationships between and movement of goods and services and factors of production between households and firms. So the circular flow model, I think, is important because it helps us kind of establish and understand this market relationship in this market economy and seeing how kind of the resource allocation occurs and how kind of we're an interdependent relationship between households and firms even if it doesn't seem that way sometimes and the money continuously flows in one direction and it also allows for us to set the stage for our next lecture which is going to be about supply and demand or as i like to call it demand and supply where we'll understand and this graph will basically be the graph that will carry you through almost the entire course where basically so households and firms represent kind of the players of who supplies what and who demands what so uh next lecture we'll discuss supply and demand and please feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have and good luck on your assignments and other courses